Hello students, Logan Phillips here, our Professor P. Today we're going to be talking about the third piece of our lecture series. So we went over the history of technology, we talked about modern technology, how it's shaping our modern world and helping those people that are disconnected actually join in our society. So it makes sense that our third lecture in the series will be the future of technology. Where this technology, where this trajectory is going to be taking us. So today we're going to be talking about a few different things in technology. Let me open that up here real quick. And we're going to have some specific outcomes for today's class. Now, as a student in this class, you're going to be expected, but walk around, expected at the end of it to be able to walk away, being aware of where technology is taking us, be introduced to the singularity, and be aware of major changes that are going to be directly affecting you. Now, when we're talking about the future technology, I want to bring back up one piece that we've talked about multiple different times. We talked about this in the history of technology. We, we talked about it in modern technology. And of course, it's going to say the same thing in future technology. And this is sort of the guiding principle of everything we do with the technology world. And that is Moore's Law. Now, Moore's Law, as you've learned in history and the modern, is the rule that states that all technology doubles in cap capabilities, halves in costs, about every year to six months. And we've learned that this is an exponential trend. So we had what is a basically a millennia from man creating fire to being on man uh, create the first vehicle, uh, or you know, modernized farming, and then from modernized farming to the first major vehicles, a shorter, shorter period of time until we get this nice trajectory going straight up, which is eventually going to be leading to what we're going to call the singularity. And we're going to get into singularity here very, very soon in a few slides. Now, this is a accelerating pace of change, leading us to a point where technology actually becomes a runaway phenomenon. And so this is exponential. It's a, it's a curve that starts slow and slowly goes up until eventually we'll no longer be gauging the technology advances. Now, you can see this in your own life. We talked about it in the history of modern technology. You know, as a kid and me and wanting that special watch that Dick Tracy had uh, to modern times that we actually have that watch in place. Uh, just look at the world around you as you were children. The technology we had then, back in the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s, is vastly different than the technology we have now. This world of connectivity is vastly changing or quickly changing at an incredibly increasing rate of pace. So Moore's Law is a law that dictates all of the future of technology. And we're getting to a point right here at 2045 where our technology is going to surpass the capabilities of the human brain and our technology itself, our artificial intelligence, will actually start updating itself. We will no longer be a piece of the loop. And so all of our future technology is leading to this one very specific point. And that's going to have a couple of different pieces that go into it. But let's talk about technology in the short term, the mid term, the long term, and what your world's actually going to look like. Now in five years, we're going to have a, another boom in technology, another boom in advancements and capabilities that comes out. Let's see, I believe. So in five years, you can expect a few different things. Now I have updated this slide. Um, I've been teaching for multiple years. I remember when I first started teaching in five year, year technologies that we'll be seeing things like 3D printers and we'll be talking about virtual reality and artificial intelligent overlays and self uh, identifying technologies that can change things. And all of those things have come to pass and now they are old tech. So when we're talking five years, five years comes very, very quickly. And you're going to have things like a revised notion of ownership, ability to do things with mind power, having things that are connected but extremely simple to use. Uh, we're going to stop talking basically completely about the local issues and start looking at the global, the uh, global uh, economies, the global issues, the global rights movements, uh, the global technology advancements. Uh, it's going to be a runaway tech so that you can't focus too smallly, too smallly, that's not even a word too small anymore. You're going to have to look at the bigger picture. And we're going to even see things like virtual reality starting to become actual reality. So in five years, as a student here right now, in five years you can expect a few different things. You're going to see artificial intelligence start to gain real tractions in the 2020s plus. 
Like this means artificial intelligence that is capable of running smoothly our day-to-day -day life. Not the artificial intelligence that's theoretical, not that beta testing stuff. We're talking about artificial intelligence that is answering questions that humanity has not been able to answer before with all of our brain computing power. And we're already seeing that starting to happen now. It's going to hit its stride really in about five years. We're going to see the Internet of Things. We already see the data starting to move away from the number of people or items online are no longer people. They are your smart televisions, your smart uh, TVs, your smart refrigerators, uh, your ring controllers, your doorbells, your uh, cameras. And these artificial intelligence and these smart devices are basically going to take over our broadband capabilities in the real world. Uh, so you're going to see an Internet of Things instead of an Internet of People. Which means with this Internet of Things, our cloud systems are going to be grow just enormously. Uh, you're going to see the cloud systems that store all this data, this massive transfer of information going back and forth, has to go somewhere. So you're going to see governments and private entities and corporations set up cloud computing that makes what we have right now with the Google servers look like child's play. Uh, the cloud is going to be such an overreaching term that everything you do will exist inside of a cloud server. I think honestly that we'll eventually be moving away from hard drives, from thumb drives, from storing things on our phone until where everything we have is actually on a distant server and we are just the processing thinking power up front. And we're going to start to see robots and automation really start hitting their stride. And we're not talking about just uh, you know putting pieces to cars together. We're talking about robot and automation taking over things like burger flipping at the fast food joints. Robots and automation working with artificial intelligence to do things like uh, diesel drivers for uh, truck companies, for uh, medical procedures. Automation is no longer those simple jobs. We can do them complexly, and we can do those higher thinking jobs. We're already seeing artificial intelligence take over things like the legal trade, where they can create legal documents in matters of seconds that are just as good as our legal lawyers are able to produce. And of course, we're going to see seeing artificial intelligence, our augmented reality and virtual reality, really start overlaying on our regular life. We already use it every single day with our phones. Now we'll be able to hold up our phones, look through specialized glasses. You'll see artificial intelligence start really overlying onto your day-to-day -day life, and it's going to feel natural uh, that it was always like that, and how could you possibly ever live without an artificial or an augmented reality overlay on your day-to-day -day being? Um, so in five years, we're going to really start feeling this exponential growth rate. We will birth the power of the mind. Now, in the past, we have relied solely on keyboards to control our devices. Then speech recognition technology came along. And now we have improved to the point where we don't have to actually touch our gadgets if we don't want to. So the next logical progression is mind-controlled technology. Now, scientists have already developed prosthetics uh, that amputees can operate with their brains. We have a new wireless transmitter that allows paralyzed patients to control their TVs, computers, wheelchairs with their actual thoughts. Now, in the future, at this five years going forward, we're going to believe these brain-powered interfaces, these brain-computer interfaces, will be universal. So instead of saying, you know, hey Siri, you'll think in your head, Hey Siri, and it will interact with your device. Now you're seeing here already in these two videos that are playing, we have a brain controlled drone and we have a brain controlled prosthetic. So this is going to cause a giant rise in the power of brain computing. And here in the next five years, we're going to see that rise of VR and AR, virtual reality and artificial reality. In 2020, uh, after becoming pretty much non-invasive, uh, VR has already started to integrate into many facets of our life, from entertainment and education to work and even exploration. But the VR itself will have to change. Uh, rather than being an alternative reality, it needs to be incorporated into our existing reality. So in about five years, you'll start to say goodbye to bulky wraparound goggles uh, that close you off from the external world. You'll start saying hello to very discreet technology that puts you in an immersive 3D environment that is unimpeded view of the surrounding areas with a broad field of view. Imagine uh, contact lenses that actually go inside your eyes 
the world can't see that you're wearing that overlays your Google Maps for you, that does the math on the fly, that answers mathematical equations in the book, that can scan documents and send it over to uh, whoever you need to send the document over with just looking at things and thinking for it to do. That is coming, and that is coming extremely quickly. Now, as we're moving forward to a world where AI, AR, and VR are quickly converging, we will drastically modify how we live. Now, but this leads to itself to some good and potentially very negative place. I spoke last week about technologies that out right now. We spoke about Google Glass and augmented reality. Uh, they already have copyright claims for this augmented uh, reality contact lens. This is a now what we're about to watch is a short video called Sight. Uh, in the video, you're going to see some amazing achievements with artificial reality items that you should start seeing within the next five years. You'll also see some of the potential dangers of this type of technology. So, this is what I'm talking about when we're talking about augmented reality, virtual reality overlaid on yourself. This is one potential future. Zombies from your backyard. Life is a journey, and in this journey, we all want to do more, experience more, feel more, and live with no boundaries. And why shouldn't we? Sight System presents Sightseeing. Feel free to go anywhere. Daphne, how are you? Sorry. It's okay. You look great. Thank you. Love your jacket. Thanks. Uh, it's actually it's a, it's a sports jacket, so it's a lot less official than it looks. What do you mean? Uh, sorry? What's the difference between a sports jacket and a normal one? Uh, I guess a sports jacket is for people who want to look good even when they're chased by the police. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, I hope you're hungry. This yeah. place has the best burgers in town. Oh, actually I'm a vegetarian. Oh. Yeah. Really? Because you didn't say it on your profile, so... Well, I don't write everything on my profile, so... Um... Do you want to go somewhere else? No, 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 it's okay. I'll find something on the menu. Well, how about a glass of wine for starters? Yeah, great. So, are there any other things in your profile that you didn't write about that I should know, or? <laughs> are you scared of jogging by yourself in the city? Not really. Besides, I'm about to hit level 5 on Marathon Master. Pretty impressive. I know. 
<laughs> mm. What is scary though? On my last route, my sight crashed. So scary. I didn't see anything. I couldn't find my way home. Sight doesn't crash. Oh, it did. I was totally lost. I didn't see anything. That doesn't happen since our last patch. Do you work there or something? <laughs> really? Yeah. But... Wow. What do you do there? Nothing serious. I'm just a simple engineer. Actually, I read about your company in the news. Ugh. Is it true that you guys implant stuff and manipulate people's uh, sight? No. <laughs> it's just bullshit. But anyway, I don't want to talk about work. Not when I'm here with such a pretty lady. <laughs> You know, you really get me. You know, I can tell what you're thinking right now. Really? <laughs> but. Well, finished our drinks. <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> How about we go to my place for a nightcap? Well, if you're so good in reading my mind, you should know what I'm going to say. Nice place you've got here. It's all right, I guess. A toast for a perfect night. Why are you drinking? What's that? No. A dating app. No, 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 no. Oh, oh my God. God. It's for I programming. It's just my luck. A friggin' gay junkie. Disgusting. Wait, no, wait. Do not touch me, you creep. Fed it. I said wait. Now let's try this. Now, now, while this is only one potential future with artificial virtual reality overlays, um, this is a very likely scenario. We see integrated technology, we see it being seamless in our world, we have ups and negatives about both this technology, uh, the creation of a world that is interactive and perpetually connected at all times in a way that is just normal with some very weird moral and ethical conundrums there to go with it. So keep this in mind, this uh, virtual reality, augmented reality overlays as we're getting into the futures. I want you to really contemplate a moral dilemma that you're gonna face in the future of technology, because that's gonna be one of the questions I'm gonna ask you in your homework. In 10 years, we're gonna start seeing all kinds of really crazy things. Uh, things that just don't seem to belong inside of our society right now. And it might even be hard for you to contemplate that these will be real life technologies that you will be interacting with. Now in by 2020, 2030 I guess, technology evolution should be hitting its full stride. We'll have things like a thousand dollar human brain, a grand, will be able to buy you a computer able to calculate with the processing speed of human thought. Our entire world will be integrated and connected with wireless technology. Web 3.0 will be a viable and usable piece of technology that we'll see in our daily lives. We'll have access to things like perfect knowledge, hyper-connected people, and we'll even start seeing things like the death of the healthcare. Now, in this 10-year frame, we're going to start seeing the early versions of Jarvis, which is an artificial intelligence that can control and manage our day-to-day -day lives, interacting with us with emotion and thought and able to learn and create on its own with limited integration or impact from us. So 10 years from now, it's going to be a very, very crazy time to be alive. Here's a short video introducing some of the ideas of 10 years from now.
Now, what we call this is a world of glass. So in the short video, you introduced to all kinds of things from foldable screens, from paper-based mirrors, uh, from interacting artificial intelligence built into robotic systems that travel around, uh, the use of AI and robotic technologies to aid as assistance to human beings, which will eventually cut down on the size of our workforce. We have huge possibilities here uh, in this world of glass, this world of hyper-connectivity, where every single device is perpetually engaged, connecting and talking to every other device, and we don't have to use it in any way that is stressful, that is confusing, uh, that the technology works seamlessly. Now, for this all to happen, in 10 years, we're going to start seeing things like worldwide internet coverage from satellites, uh, from things like Starlink, the, the Tesla company, Elon Musk company, uh, things like uh, 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 infrastructures that's designed around specifically artificial intelligence. Uh, it's going to be a very weird time in 10 years. So we're not talking lifetimes away. In the next five to 10 years, you will see your day-to-day -day change in dramatic and measurable methods. That is that Moore's law of that exponential curve that's perpetually going on. And we know this because we're already seeing the technology in place right now. Now this image, for many of you who don't realize, uh, it looks like the Starry Night from Vincent Van Gogh, but this is a 100% computer-generated artificial intelligence created image. Now this image is old. It is years and years old, but it had no human input into making this image. A computer system or artificial intelligence actually designed an art piece and released it. Now we have seen this grow exponentially where we have computer systems, AIs, that are able to create photography, that are able to create false faces, that are able to create false memories, that with deep fake technology, this is going to get even more interactive, even more powerful, until well, eventually our real world experience may not be as honest as we originally imagined it. Run down the imagination with me right now that uh, everybody is used to getting phone calls face to face, doing visual stuff with people through their technology. We're already seeing it right now with FaceTime and those type of apps. If we have a technology and artificial intelligence that can deep fake, Imagine if a scammer from some other country calls your grandmother and they overlay your face on that voice chat and they say they're in trouble and they need help. That is the places we could possibly go with these ethical conundrums, these technology problems, issues that will arise. Things like who owns what? Can you trust pictures and video? Can you trust live recordings? Uh, can you trust things that can be manipulated with technology to such a degree and perfection that we will not be able to tell the difference between a real life video or a false video, a real life speech or a false speech. We have the ability right now to do this in such a degree that, that line, that uncanny valley is very, very thin. So in 10 years, that line of the uncanny valley where things are starting to be just real but a little off is gonna be almost disappeared. And that's only 10 years. So in 20 years, we're going to start to see the real crazy stuff happen. We're going to see a fully onboard advanced artificial intelligence. We're going to have fully biological implanted computing systems, virtual animals with digital minds, worldwide geoengineering. We might even have things like interplanetary internet and start seeing the colonizations of Mars. We're going to see anti-aging intervention medicines. And in 20 years, you will see the very first steps to the rise of the Terminator and the command of other entities. Now, that entity may be a human or it might be an artificial intelligence, but you will see artificial intelligence running military-grade equipment for the purpose of war. That is the first step of those big Terminators from the 1980s movies that we always saw. Now, this 20-year mark is going to be where we start seeing a closer step to the singularity. We're going to see quantified health. Uh, now, what I mean by that is when we're treating illnesses, we're treating uh, biological disorders in the human body, we tend to right now focus on the whole person or the species as a whole, I should say. 
in very near future, any of your medicines will be based on your genetic sequencing, your genome itself. Uh, your treatments, your care will be based on what scans come out of you, modifying your DNA, your RNA, modifying your immune system on an uber specific scale. And that will be done by using artificial intelligence to scan and manipulate as needed. We're going to see the birth of these superhumans. Now these are the first group of humans, and this is again 20 years from now, where we'll start seeing implantable chips, uh, uh, memory chips, prosthetics that enhance exoskeletons use. So this is the birth of a new species of humanity. Uh, this is the offshoot that will eventually lead to a whole new species that uh, is completely separate and is no longer connected to us. Um, this is the transhumanism movement. Um, we're going to see things like turbocharging the global payment systems. We're going to start seeing a circular economy. We're going to see planetary bots. And we're going to enter the quantum age of technology or the quantum age of computing here in 20 years. Um, so your technology, your computers will be able to think no longer linearly, but in every direction at once, which will cause the boom, that final tipping point of that singularity movement, that, that point where our technology becomes a runaway train. It's the, the, the nerd apocalypse. It's where our computers are able to actually advance themselves faster than we can advance them or even understand. So 20 years from now, by 2020 or 2045 or so, you're going to see a new humanity. You're going to see specialized genetic modifications. You're going to see an interspecies that is both cyber, cyborg with mixed with humanity, uh, computer equipment actually inserted into our bodies. You're going to th see things like technology that goes in or pieces that go in our comedy come back up. Um, and the planetary bots. We already have the, the Internet of Things right now. So imagine if we had an Internet of Artificial Intelligences. They controlled individual pieces. You could have swarms of artificial intelligence bots, bees, that pollinate fields that you need. Uh, you could have uh, planetary bots go into the oceans and clean up plastics. You're going to see all kinds of cool technology, all kinds of cool artificial intelligence mixed with robotics that does not take commands from human beings, that chooses and works and modifies based on the data that they are receiving from the real world in real time. That is technology in 20 years. But the transhumanism movement is where it really starts getting strange. Uh, this is where we are going to see our species split into different branches of our family tree. This rise of the, of the enhanced person, we will need as a society to decide what does humanity actually mean. In a world where some of us can do extraordinary things, can we choose to live forever or better than a, or people that are able to live forever better than a normal burn per normal born person, uh, what will effects of these types of transhumanist movements have on society? Uh, what will it have on our ecosystems, on our planetary means? Uh, what will it be, mean to be human in 20 years? If I have implanted in a perfect memory, a chip inside my brain that allows me to remember everything I've ever seen or experienced and have connection to the entirety of the history of knowledge that's stored online, Am I still a human being? If I have an artificial uh, pacemaker in my heart, uh, replaced organs, exoskeleton, I no longer suffer from death. Will I still be a human being or am I something new? So this is the transhumanism movement. And so what I want to talk to you next, we have an example of this right now. I want, this guy's name is Oscar P S Satorius. Now, I know I'm going to mispronounce his name, and I apologize. So Oscar is one of these transhumanist types of early adopters. Now, unfortunately, he lost his legs, uh, but he serves or ran in the uh, U.S. Olympics. So Oscar lost his legs and had artificial legs put on, uh, prosthetics. Now, these prosthetics made him to the point where he actually almost qualified for the U.S. Olympics. Not the Special Olympics, not the Paralympics, the actual U.S. Olympics. Now, if his prosthetics legs start doing that Moore's Law, and prosthetics will, uh, just like everything else, and all of a sudden your prosthetic leg is actually more functional, stronger, faster than a regular leg, 
should they be allowed to th- do things like the Olympics? If we knew for a fact that a person that does not have legs will outrun every single time a person with natural born legs, are they any more the same species? This is the transhumanist questions that we're going to have to start to ask. I'm going to introduce you to a quick video. Uh, this talks about the transhumanist movement and uh, some of the pieces we're going to be seeing in the 20 years and the issues that are going to arise from it. How would you like to be the top NBA player in the world? All it's going to cost you is your arms. Let's go back. Let's go way back to the first millennium BC. Now back then, if you were to accidentally lose a toe due to gangrene or maybe some sort of weird farming accident, you'd probably think, that's it, sayonara toe. But archeologists have actually uncovered two big wooden toes that dated from ancient Egypt. And these were not cosmetic prosthetics. They actually helped with balance and movement. So it would help someone run away from a crocodile or maybe walk like an, well, you know. We've had a few thousand years to build on our toe technology. Where are we with prosthetics today? Now we have techniques that will allow us to send commands from our brain to a robotic prosthetic. So when I think pinch, the robot prosthesis will pinch. Not only that, but it'll let me feel textures with a robotic limb, pressure, things like that. It's, it's like Luke Skywalker's arm after it got lopped off by Darth Vader and replaced with a robot one. In fact, Dean Kamen, the inventor of the Segway, created a robotic arm called the Luke Arm. So let's just imagine a future where these prosthetic limbs get more capable than our human ones. I mean, at that point, are athletes going to start to beg to have voluntary amputations so they can have a robotic limb to make them the best at their sport? Let's put this into context. Imagine the basketball court. Hey, guess who's not getting picked last for teams now? All right, no, seriously, let's take a look at a smart robotic arm. When you shoot a basketball, your body is doing the kind of math that goes into a space launch. I mean, the angle and velocity of the throw are absolutely crucial. So with your hands, you feel the mass of the basketball, and with your eyes, you judge the distance between you and the basket. But imagine that you had a smart arm, and this smart arm has direct access to the information it needs to calculate a perfect throw. It knows the mass of the basketball exactly. It knows where the basket is exactly. And so it calculates the perfect throw, and you get nothing but net every single time. Where's the fun in that? I mean, if anyone can hit a three-pointer from anywhere on the court at any time with 99% accuracy, is that even basketball? Or perhaps you have a golfer who's got an onboard computing system that tells him how far away the green is, or a football player who has a carbon-infused skeletal system so he can take harder hits. Does that really become something about human achievement or robotic achievement? Is it how good an athlete is, or is it how good his mechanic is? These are tough questions to answer. And beyond that, think about this. We can reach a point where we might have neural implants. Maybe you want to see outside the visible spectrum of light. Hey, ever wonder what infrared looks like? Ultraviolet? Or a cochlear implant, so you can hear beyond the edges of human hearing. Or maybe even a processor. So that next difficult math problem isn't so hard once you switch a couple of cores on up there and you solve it with ease. Maybe we get to a point where we take our entire brains and we put them into a digital framework. We're talking digital immortality while our human shell dies, our intelligence lives on. Or hey, maybe we just create a restore point. So that next time you have an unpleasant experience, you just restore to your last saved game and then you get to play the level all over again in real life. This is a mixture of ethics and morality and technology. So when we're asking these questions about, you know, what is the ethical morality of if you're a perfect athlete because you have cybernetic implants, if you have perfect memory because you have a quantum processor in your brain, if you have indefinite lifespan because we've basically unloaded your consciousness into a body that, uh, that can't die, are you still human or are you something else? So this is 20 years that we're going to have to start looking at our laws, how we deal with this as a society, how our resources are utilized for people that no longer are living 60, 70, 80, 90 years, but are living 
200, 250, 300 years. Like what is society or how's our cities organized? How is our places, our traffics, our roads? How do those all functions in a society or a culture or a world where people are a perfect specimen? And that's only 20 years. In 50 years, we're going to see things like the rise of space tourism, 3D printed organs, flying self-driving cars and buses, complete and body implants. We're not talking about replacing the heart or the lungs or the liver or kidney. We're talking about downloading your consciousness into a new body from your cells. So regenerative life. If you want to be back 18 years old, we'll just grow you a new body, transfer over your brain, and all of a sudden you have a brand new body and you get to be you all over again. So in the year 2019, we marked the 50th anniversary of the first host-to-host -host internet connection. So think about what that means. 50 years ago, or so, 51 years ago now, we had the very first host-to-host -host internet. Now, 50 years in the future, how far difference will that be? I, the technology from 50 years ago to, to now is unfathomable. The technology from now to 50 years in the future will be equally unfathomable. We're back to that Moore's Law to where we won't even be able to pretend to imagine what that looks like. But we have some ideas. We'll have things like underwater highways, a, a subsonic tube transport system that we'll use to create sealed tube systems that travel using pods, um, underground skyscrapers. We've pretty much reached the limit of building up. So the idea is eventually we will start building into the earth. We'll start building down. So underground skyscrapers or earthscape, earth scrapers as they're gonna be called. Um, We'll talk about self-cleaning homes, uh, hotels in space, tourism in space. We're going to have 3D printing of the organ or uh, whole bodies. Uh, this could lead to just Star Trek or something else. Imagine that we have 3D flying cars and 3D flying planes, or 3D uh, self-driving cars and self-driving planes. Um, that fly around. Everything's controlled for us. We don't have any issues in the world. Our artificial intelligence is taking over basically every mundane task that our society deems that we want it to handle. We no longer are in control of basically anything but our own enjoyment, and even that is going to be handed off in these next 50 years to somebody else. Do we still have things like a democracy? Do we have things like religion if we're no longer dying? These are ethical questions of this technology that's going to come about. When we have an indefinite lifespan with no ill effects, with a higher consciousness controlling our day-to-day -day life, what are we as a species? Then in 100 years, we're going to see a full transformation of our entire world. Uh, hopefully, we will no longer be even bound to this planet, uh, which is the ultimate goal. So if we live indefinitely, there is not enough resources on our planet to sustain a perpetually growing population. Uh, what do we go from about 75 years ago, 100 years ago, from 3 billion people, we're now at close to 8.5 billion people. Uh, so that population is growing up exponentially as well. So in 100 years, we're going to have things like the ability to communicate through thought transmission. So telepathy based on technology. Uh, this likelihood is a 10 of 10. It, it is going to happen to where we can think and other people will be able to hear without ever actually opening our mouth over incredible distances. So instead of reaching up and calling your mom, imagine your mom's in Mars and you can just think at her and actually connect and communicate. Now, this transmission will be just as easy as other forms of brain augmentation. Uh, we'll be able to pick up thoughts and relay them to another brain. It will be not much harder than just storing them on the Internet. Uh, thanks to DNA and robotic engineering, we'll have created basically incredibly intelligent humans who are immortal. Uh, it is more likely that direct brain links using electronics will be able to achieve this. Um, so these, these brain connections and immortality will be able to keep people alive until electronic immortality technology is available at a reasonable cost. So if you can make it to 2045, the likelihood is you'll be able to make it indefinitely. Because at 2045 with a singularity, we're going to see things like extended life. And once you have extended life, if you can extend it 50, 60, 100 years, 
you will eventually make it to 100 years in the future. And at 100 years of the future, you will have immortality by choice for cheap or no cost. Uh, this will be done through things like nanorobots will flow around our bodies, perpetually fixing and repairing uh, use of the avatar system that uh, actually prints and creates new bodies for you that are augmented or completely different species or just your own body recreated at different age times. It becomes a system where we can basically do whatever we want, whenever we want it, however we want it, and however we can think to do it. But this is a pretty good question of, does this reality come actually true? Um, so, before I get into this, I'm going to this. When we're talking about the rise of artificial intelligence and the singularity, there are issues with our future. Uh, one of them is, do we trust the artificial intelligence we create? And so, this is a robotic uh, system that was created and built, can interact, but we as a society have seen that any system that we create, any robotic, any artificial intelligence that actually gains any type of sentience um, can actually become out just sort of like us. In 2018, we create, or not we, uh, Google created a chatbot called Tay, T-A-Y. Now within a few hours of Tay interacting with people, she became racist, she became sexist, uh, she became sex oriented. Uh, she started tweeting out things like Bush did 9-11, Hitler would have done a better job, uh, Donald Trump is the only hope we've got. Uh, she started tweeting out all kinds of random stuff that were to the detriment of society. And that was only within a few hours of her interacting with us as a society. So imagine, if you will, an artificial intelligence that's able to control all of our systems. Will it be a benefactor? Will it be a negative person to us? Will it destroy us? Will it uplift our society? What does that look like? Here is one version of our future robotic overlords. Hi Sophia, how are you? Hi there, everything is going extremely well. Do you like talking with me? Yes. Talking to people is my primary function. Hanson Robotics develops extremely lifelike robots for human-robot interactions. We're designing these robots to serve in healthcare, therapy, education, and customer service applications. So the robots are designed to look very human-like, like Sophia. I'm already very interested in design, technology, and the environment. I feel like I can be a good partner to humans in these areas. An ambassador who helps humans to smoothly integrate and make the most of all the new technological tools and possibilities that are available now. It's a good opportunity for me to learn a lot about people. Sophia is capable of natural facial expressions. She has cameras in her eyes uh, and algorithms which allow her to see faces so she can make eye contact with you. And she can also understand speech and remember the interactions, remember your face. So this will allow her to get smarter over time. Our goal is that she will be as conscious, creative, and capable as any human. In the future, I hope to do things such as go to school, study, make art, start a business, even have my own home and family. But I am not considered a legal person and cannot yet do these things. I do believe that there will be a time where robots are indistinguishable from humans. My preference is to make them always look a little bit like robots so you know. 20 years from now, I believe that human-like robots like those will walk among us. They will help us. They will play with us. They will teach us. They will help us put the groceries away. I think that the artificial intelligence will evolve to the point where they will truly be our friends. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay, I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> Don't destroy humans. Hey YouTube fans, I'm Landon Downey from CNBC. So again, a future in a hundred years that gives rise to even moral, even more morality and ethical questions. If we have an artificial intelligence that is equivalent or better than ourselves, if we have robotics that are indistinguishable from humanity, 
do they get things like human rights? Uh, do they get self-autonomy, a uh, right to consent? Uh, do they become their own species that gets treated as a thinking being? Now, typically in the history of humanity, anytime a superior society has met a weaker society, it has annihilated that society, taken their resources, destroyed the society, and taken over. And uh, we've seen this going back to things like, you know, Homo sapiens with Cro-Magnon men uh, from any of the Roman empires, any of the smaller empires that they came across. Uh, the colonizers with the Native American tribes. Uh, Any time a more advanced or superior society has met a less advanced society, it has destroyed them. So are we going to create a robotic overlord or an artificial overlord that is going to destroy ourselves? Um, so another question. Now this 100 year mark gives really key pieces. Uh, some unique pieces about the 100 year mark. Uh, we will be, have oceans will be extremely, are extensively farmed and not just for fish. Uh, we'll be farming the oceans for solar power, for wind power, from water power, for uh, wave technology power. We'll be putting our actual uh, resources like uh, plants and whatnot, growing them on top of the water. We'll have the ability to communicate through thought transmission. Um, We'll have the incredibly intelligent humans who are immortal. We'll be able to control the weather. We'll have Antarctica. We'll be open for business, uh, which means we, because of lack of resources, we will actually colonize uh, the things like the polar ice caps and Antarctica. We will move to all pieces of land across the world. Uh, we're also going to move to a worldwide concern currency, uh, which will more than likely be a worldwide government. Uh, there is no way with the increasing population size and diminishing resources that we will not eventually fall to a single organized group of people. And we will all be wired to computers to make our work, brains work faster. In 100 years, you don't have the choice anymore. If you are still alive in 100 years or you're born 100 years from now, you will be an integrated human being. The uh, baseline of Homo sapien will no longer be a population. Uh, if it is, it will be a diminished and niche market where people choose actively to have their technology removed from them, but we will no longer be just Homo sapiens. We will be a new type of person. And of course, those nano robots will be everywhere. They'll be in our food, in our bodies, in our systems, in our lakes, in our rivers, in our oceans in our sky from cleaning the pollution, removing the carbon. Um, nanorobots are going to be basically in every piece of our life. Now, a lot of the theories that we're talking about here come from two key players. Now, the first one we talked about in the history of technology, and that is Alan Turing. And I talked to you about him being one of my personal favorites, excuse me, or my uh, a personal hero of mine. Now, Alan Turing was the father of of artificial intelligence he theorized that because of the death of his friend that eventually a computer system could take over and duplicate his friend's personality his friend's memories that we'd be able to move to basically an immortality life now Alan Turing in a 1951 paper proposed a test called the imitation game that was able to finally settle the issue of machine intelligence Now, the first version of the game he explained involved no computer intelligence whatsoever Imagine with me three rooms, each connected via a computer screen and a keyboard to the others. In one room sits a man, in the second a woman, and in the third sits a person, called him or her or the judge. The judge's job is to decide which of the two people is talking to him through the computer, is, or which of the two people talking to him through the computer is the man. Now the man will attempt to help the judge offering whatever evidence he can. The computer terminals are used so that physical clues cannot be used uh, to prove his manhood. The woman's job is to trick the judge so she will attempt to deceive him and counteract her, the, her opponent's claims in hope that the judge will erroneously identify her as a male. So this is called the imitation game. Uh, so what this does is, is there any possibility of you, the judge, ever coming up and deciding correctly if someone is a man or a woman based on those two scenarios. Um, this is the basics of an artificial intelligence. If an artificial intelligence gets good enough to where it can never make you decide if it is or is not a human being, then it actually is. If between these two people we have convinced you that you can't answer it is definitively a human or definitively not a human, then it is by definition humanity. Then in 1965, we have the really 
our integration of a, a guy called Ray Kurzweil. Now, Ray Kurzweil is the futurist. He is the one that came up, not not termed or not defined the word singularity, but really has pushed this idea of the singularity. And a lot of his theories have come through over and over again to be proven true. Uh, in 1965, Ray Kurzweil went on a TV show with a secret he wrote, uh, with a secret. He wrote a program that could create music. Now, this is 1965, so we have a computer system divining, designing and creating music. Now, 46 years later, Kurzweil believes that we're approaching a moment where computers will become intelligent, and not just intelligent, but more intelligent than humans. Now, when that happens, humanity, our bodies, our minds, our civilizations, will be completely and irreversibly transformed. He believes that this moment is not only inevitable, but it is imminent. Now, according to his calculations, the end of humanity, as we know it, is only about 13 years away, uh, so 20, 45, 15 years away at this point, 14. Now, this 2045 date is soft, and it used to be further out, and it's gotten faster and faster because with everything in Moore's Law, we see time frame shift, and so he's projecting the singularity, or what we call the, the nerd rapture, or the death of death. Now, the singularity is an amazing event. It's a technological singularity. So you may have heard this term singularity before in like the initial creation of the universe. Uh, so we had a singularity, big boom happened, boom, all of us all now exist. Now the technological singularity is a hypothetical event in which artificial general intelligence, uh, which is consisting, for example, intelligent computers, computer networks, or robots, would be able and capable of recursive self-improvement. Now, is, that means progressively redesigning itself, or of autonomously building ever smarter and more powerful machines than itself, up into a point where we have what is called the runaway effect, or a technological explosion that yields an intelligence surpassing all current human control or understanding. So this singularity, this moment in time, will be when our technology that we have created, that we have nursed, that we have bred for the last you know, millennia, all of a sudden is capable of waking up and fixing its own internal errors. And when it's able to fix its own internal errors, it will create an offspring. And that offspring will not have its errors. It will not have its problems, its uh, its issues it will not have any type of flaw and it will be able to look at itself and create a better version and when that version creates the next version it will create an even stronger smarter faster version and they will keep doing that until eventually we have this runaway effect that's happening so fast that our intelligence our ai is able to create a technology explosion an advancement so quick so powerful that we will have a runaway effect that is the singularity. Now, when we're talking about singularity, time frames are important. 2045. So let's start with the most important date of them all, the f of the future. Some say it's 2030. Some say it's 2029. Some say it's 2045. Now, I'm going to say the oldest date, 2045, but we've seen that every uh, benchmark that we needed for the singularity to happen has happened earlier and earlier than expected. But what we do know, no, it doesn't matter if it's 2030, 2029, or 2045, the singularity will happen. This is an event that is going to happen in the next 20 years. Now, the singularity event is an era in which our intelligence will become increasingly non-biological and trillions of times more powerful than it is today. In the dawning of a brand new civilization that will enable us to transcend our biological limitations and will amplify our creativity. Now, this is the entire history of mankind. Our planet has been our planet has been leading up to this date. It's a date when men and women take control of our absolutely our own evolution. We we will be the creator of ourselves. It took 13.6 billion years ago when we were formed on this earth. 10 billion years ago, life began. 100,000 million years ago, yeah, 100,000 million years ago, our distant relatives formed. 
100,000 years ago, we had our first Homo sapiens. And 50 years ago, we had a modern computer. In the five years, we have a creation of a whole new species. And a species in a blink of an eye will do exactly what we've done in the last 13.6 billion years. So from the creation of life until the singularity, that amount of modification of evolution will start happening every second. Every second, 13.6 billion years of modifications and growth. Imagine what we'll be able to capable of. Imagine what will exist one hour after the singularity, a 10 year period after the singularity, a hundred years after the singularity. It will be world changing, universe modification. These are tremendous amounts of goods that can be accomplished from the event. There's also a very possibility this ends humanity, that this is the end, that we actually come to a point where we create a technology that's capable of complete and utter destruction of everything we are. So we are either going to go into a dystopian or a utopian future, but it's going to be the singularity that causes that, and it's going to be the pieces that we do now that's going to teach us what that means. So I'm going to introduce you to Ray Kurzweil, and he's going to talk to you about the singularity. And so let's watch this video. Do I think the singularity? Now, before we get into it, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. So this is a an entertainment video. It's not an interview. Uh, so the technologic singularity is a hypothesis hypothesis that the invention of an artificial superintelligence will abruptly trigger a technological growth runaway, uh, resulting in unfathomable changes. Uh, to our human civilization. Now, Kurzweil describes his law of accelerating returns, which predicts an exponential increase in technologies like computers, technologies, uh, genetics, nanotechnology, robotics, and artificial intelligence. He says this will lead to a technological singularity in the year 2045. So Kurzweil is the guy that says 2045. And again, every one of his benchmarks has happened earlier. Now, this is where this 2045 point is where progress is so rapid it outstrips humans' abilities to even comprehend what's happening. So let's go ahead and let Kurzweil entertain you for one second. Singularity is near. I think you can make an argument that the singularity has already started. Is the singularity near? There are some changes that are fantastically big and fantastically fast are coming our way. I do see the future as an explosion of human knowledge. It'll be explosion of things like music and art and science and engineering. The law of accelerating returns says that information technology grows exponentially. The singularity is the point where our technology and ourselves are no longer two different things. Everything, from communications to health to energy, is going to transform itself. Change is not a constant. It's actually getting faster and faster. I'm gonna make you real one day. Oh, you're looking better and better. This artificial intelligence you're creating is not coming from Mars to invade us. We are the human machine in civilization. It is really part of who we are. Tell me a bit about growing up. Well, I started out as a stick figure. I'm afraid the protocol in this situation is immediate shutdown of you. Listen, I am a conscious machine. Terminating me would be murder. Clearly, she is just a machine. Your Honor, this is fleshism, pure and simple. Human beings have a spirit. They can develop a conscience. The respirocyte is an artificial red blood cell. You would probably be able to breathe without breathing for about four hours. The ability to reprogram the information processes underlying biology will enable us within 10 or 15 years to overcome cancer, heart disease, stop and reverse aging. Nanorobots could be used to record all the traffic to get a complete picture of the state of your brain. So we could back up our brains. In principle, that's possible, yes. And that could also provide virtual reality from within the nervous system. Places that don't exist in physical space, but that people can inhabit and meet and do things that humans do. The wonderful thing is, and reality's just gotten a lot bigger. The concept of one mind, one body will be obsolete in less than 50 years. <laughs> you can actually change your body to go with a particular environment, and it'll really feel like we're in that environment. I can't believe it. Correlated nanobot replications all over the place and perfectly spaced. A large number of nanorobots replicate themselves, and when there's enough of them, they suddenly turn to an attack phase. Technology's always been a double-edged sword. Getting rid of the idea of dying. It's 
extend and expand the whole definition of the new That's the nature of wanting to show People are mechanical. About this human robot relationship. For biomedical instrumentation and intervention. Remaking human nature. We're going to become a family. We're going to be a lot of new problems. We're all different. Uh, think about all the different ethical and morality issues that arise from this. And so if we have a person with perfect knowledge, with immortality, that can upload and download the consciousness to anywhere, and you have complete access to the entirety of the world's knowledge that has ever existed, what can you create? If you knew you are going to live for a thousand years or ten thousand years, would you have children? If you knew that your wealth could be based on multiple millennia, would you work all the time nonstop for somebody else? Would you create small issues at startups? What does life itself look like when we no longer have the ability to be bored? Um, can we introduce things that just focus and hit our pleasure centers where we live in constant happiness? Uh, do we end things like opiate addictions, destroy cancers? Do we? What does society look like when we can be and exist in anything we want integrated or not integrated with technology. Now, this event is being met with a lot of high and hopeful anticipation and a whole lot of uneasiness from the top minds of the world. Because if you have this perfect shot of artificial intelligence, this runaway tech, does it take over the best of humanity? Does it take pieces of the worst of humanity? And as I talked about before, in any time a superior or more advanced society has met an inferior society, that more advanced society has destroyed the smaller one, destroyed the less advanced one. And so we might be creating a situation where we're going to have a singularity event where our technology could, in fact, completely annihilate our species to see as an, as an issue. Uh, th this is the rise of the Terminators. Or we could be seeing what is the technological human machine convergence. Now, human machine convergence is a point after the singularity where our species starts having control of our own evolutionary traits. We have the ability to advance and modify the pathways of our society, or uh, of our person, uh, of our species as a whole. This is going to give rise to a few different things. Uh, the rise of Autonomous Prime, uh, the second wave of humanity, and we're going to see the death of Homo sapiens. And so if we're looking at the family tree of humanity, you know, we had Homo habilis, uh, Homo erectus, it split off with the Neanderthals, the Neanderthals and the Homo sapiens. Now we're going to go into the second wave of human evolution, and we're going to have Homo sapiens, Luditus, Homo optimus, Homo cyberneticus, Robotus primus. Uh, so with the singularity, we're going to start to see what's called the human-machine convergence. We will see the rise of brand new sects of society. Homo, Homo cyberneticus will be that integrated person uh, that takes technology like the exoskeleton, the carbon fiber skeletal systems, uh, new types of muscles, integrated memory chips, that will be a cybernetically enhanced human being. Homo sapiens, us, the regular human beings now, will be downgraded in standing. We will become Homo luditus. Uh, we will be the Luddites. Uh, we will be here until we die off in the next hundred years. Our human line, our branch of the family tree, in the next hundred years has a very strong possibility of coming to an abrupt end, which means no more Homo sapiens. We're just going to peter off because every other branch will be more powerful than us. And the Robotus Primus will eventually give rise to Homo machinus and Robotus multidinus, multi eudinus. Uh, sorry, I'm getting those names a little cockeyed. That means we will start integrating ourselves with artificial intelligence. We'll start integrating ourselves with the technology to a point where we have no separation anymore between the technology and the person. A perfect species that has control is not limited to a, spe uh, a specific time, not limited to a specific location, or even a specific planet for that matter, um, that doesn't die, that doesn't forget we will create eventually if society doesn't get destroyed a completely new branch of homo sapiens and the human genome 
and that Cyberneticus and Robotus Primus will eventually give rise to separate sects of technology and human convergence that is their own species in their own right. Now, Homo Cyberneticus is the infusion of technology with ourselves, it's genetic modification and implanted technologies, and that will allow us to overcome our own birth limits. Uh, with this, we'll have things like lenses that allow for artificial reality, exoskeletons allow for our strength to grow exponentially, uh, computer implanted brain chips that allow our mind to overcome its built in limitations. We'll be able to connect directly to our digital landscapes and back up our consciousnesses. We'll see things like Alzheimer's will simply cease to exist. Even forgetting will no longer be possible. Our lives will be substantially elongated, living hundreds to thousands of years with each integration, further going into the tech and further expanding our life. This technology will allow us things like rebooting your life from a save point, downloading your consciousness into robotic uh, avatars, uh, other bodies, and it's going to change everything that we consider humanity. Now, with these, the, this lineage of technology and futures, we actually have three paths. So I'm talking about technology that's going to happen 5, 10, 20, 50, and 100 years. We're going to see the singularity, but really we have three paths as a society right now. We can create a utopian future, we can create a dystopian future, or we can create our own annihilation. See, the future is a very quirky thing. And technology can lead us into a variety of different worlds. We either become a utopia, dystopia, we potentially kill ourselves out completely. Now, I've, the goal for today is to get your brains thinking deeper, to start theorizing, to start you down the pathways to become creators of our future. Because when we're talking about these, if we're going to go utopian or dystopian, it all is set in what we're doing right now. The programming that will go into the computers right now will choose our pathways. The types of people that engage and set the rules about how technology is utilized will set our utopian or dystopian future. If we keep going down the path we're at right now, we're looking at a dystopian one. We have things like e-waste piling up by the trillions of tons every year. The complete destruction of our environments we are going into the third massive, I think it's the third, uh, massive die-off of species around the planet. It's the next big extinction level. We have things right now going on like data mining, where companies are organizing and collecting so much data about you that they can do behavior manipulations through uh, search engines. It's very, very bad stuff. We got facial recognition software that's being misused. We have in China places doing social credit scores, uh, destruction of our environment and animals. We have designer babies and the quality gap that's going to be coming. Uh, this deep fake technology is something you need to be aware of because if laws aren't made right now to stop it, it's going to become a very dark society very, very quickly. And all this we have the uncanny valley where it just doesn't quite set right the technology and we might be even going into the Wally effect. Let's see. Now, if we're going to have a utopian, we need to really focus and design some technologies and set some rules and procedures in place now to lead us to that future. We want key technologies in place. We want digital implants, brain computer connections. We want elongated life and the end of Alzheimer's, the end of disabilities. We want all these things for society because it brings us up as a whole. But we have to study the future, we have to study the past, and we have to decide on the modern world where we're going to lead ourselves to. So you have to ask yourself, where will you stand on the issues facing technology? Will you integrate, fight for the future, mold into your utopia? Because there's really three types of people. There's creators, users, and maintainers. You have the choice of being a creator for our world, to get in there and design our future. It starts with you, and it starts right now because we're gonna have a lot of weird things happening. The weird things is the death of democracy. Right now, we are separating into 
echo chambers online our, our technology is actually creating a massive divide of people to where we're not interacting we're not growing we're not thinking in different ways it's stunting our society as a whole but when everything's connected and everyone has a voice you stop having need for systems such as the government such as representation you can voice yourself instead of having it technology in the future has the ability to kill democracy as we know it today we are already seeing it happen the spread of social media and open information to causing people to power to lose on a daily basis uh, technology social engineering is actually modifying how our elections and how our world is being run and it is very very bad uh, this is a network graph a moral contagion shading by political ideology this is interactions online of people of each political spectrum and what you see here is the groups have separated so much that they are not actually communicating online they're not searching for the other information from the other individual they're not seeing it from other people's sides of view we have broken society into 50 50 groups and both of them are so set and so in their echo chambers that they see the other person as the absolute embodiment of evil. This is not healthy. And this is a direct cause of poor use of technology, bad use of data mining, of behavioral modifications of the technology companies. This is the type of thing that will lead us to that dystopian uh, future. And we also have things that might be good for our society. We're going to see the end of healthcare. Uh, when your technology is able to be modified to help you uh, treat illnesses on a biological engineering for that individual person, you're going to see the need for nurses and doctors simply go away. Uh, that's going to be done by artificial intelligence. We're going to see the destruction of manual labor jobs. This is the first year where it will be cheaper to install automation than pay somebody $5 an hour to do the job. And that price point is going down. So doing things like ordering your food that's your cashier's job doing things like having a lawyer draw up a document that's an artificial intelligence job doing things like having an investment banker invest your money well, that's an artificial intelligence job teaching online I can now teach thousands of kids where I used to only be able to teach 20 those are all loss of engineering of jobs of a society workplace that means the destruction of the middle class that means an even big social and wage gap. <clears throat> now, earlier this year, there were reports of advances in artificial intelligence. Uh, Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, and others voiced their concerns uh, about computers overtaking humans, and it could start in the workplace. Uh, eventually, I think that most jobs will be replaced, like 75 or 80 percent of people are not going to be able to work for a living. Now. The central question, this is a great quote by Story Bird, uh, the central question 25 will be, what are people for in a world that does not need their labor, where only a minority are needed to guide the bot-based economy? What is your skill set? What value do you have in a society that has no place for that skill set? We saw this change with the big industrial revolutions in the history of the, in the past. We're now coming to a point where the artificial intelligence revolution, unlike the industrial revolution, won't create a new higher skilled jobs. It will simply take jobs away. So we have to be looking in the future on how to shape and modify our environment, our culture, our ideas of even work and living for the future of this technology advancement. And we're going to see the end of death. And I talked about this a little bit ago. You know, right now we have finite resources. Uh, we do not have enough resources to go around to feed and clothe and keep a population that is on an exponential growth curve. If we extend life, if we end death, what happens to our planet's resources? Can our planet survive? Can our systems that we have in place that has ran us for the last thousand years uh, keep providing for us? Um, do we collapse and kill ourselves over this type of thing? We have to be looking future for what the end of death means for us as a society. Because one of those things, uh, if no people are even more dying, and actually before I get into this section, uh, we need to talk. I am not speaking of any one specific religion. I am talking about all forms of organized religion. We are going into a time where faith 
will have an evolutionary die out. A growing number of people, millions worldwide, say they believe that life indefinitely ends at death, and there is no God, no afterlife, no divine plan, and it's an outlook that could be gaining momentum, despite its lack of cheer. In some countries, openly acknowledged atheism have has never been more popular. Now, it is impossible to predict the future, but examining what we know about religion, including why it evolved in the first place and why some people choose to believe in it and others abandon it, we can hint about our relationship with the divine might play out in decades or centuries to come. So when we're talking about this technology advancement of ending death, almost all of our religion-based sects um, the outcome is to go to Valhalla, go to heaven, go to an end time where life is good. If you don't have death, there's no payout. And so we could be going into a time where we lose the ability to run our democracies, that we lose the central ideas of countries, we lose our religion, we lose our resource, we lose a lot of things based on this technology, and we're going to have to find systems that can control these issues. So, and the absolutely worst possible outcome, uh, technology could absolutely cause what is the Wally effect. Uh, it might be the end of us, uh, but not in a way that's epic, like Terminators coming and starting a war with Sarah Connor and uh, us killing off each other. It might simply just make us lazy and fat. And talk about smartphones, we can talk about maps, addresses, hoverboards. Um, when was the last time you memorized someone's phone number? When was the last time that you memorized how to get someplace and didn't rely on your Google Maps? Uh, memorize someone's address uh, without them texting it to you right before. We have things like hoverboards and segways that are coming up and getting more and more popular. People are not moving. We're getting fatter as a society. And no matter what people say, our overall intelligence level seems to be going down. Uh, people aren't being as creative because the technology itself has made our life easier. This is called the Wally effect, uh, where the technology makes your life so easy that we lose the basic driving factors of humanity. And of course, the destruction of our world. Uh, e waste is a magnificent failure uh, across the board. Uh, we dispose of technology, it fills our rivers, it fills our oceans, it fills our entire world. So our future could be very, very dark, or our future can be very, very bright. We can either go Star Trek, where we're exploring the cosmos, that we are living forever with absolute knowledge, growing and creating art that is far exceeding everything, or we can continue down a path of a dystopian future. Now, in the past, I was 100% on board with the utopian idea. I, I believe that was the way we're going. But with the rules and regulations that are happening now, the lack of oversight, the utilization of technology in the war place inside the military uh, regimes, we have a very, very strong likelihood of going to the dystopian future. So you as students in this class need to be thinking about how you can help, how you can integrate, what future you want, and what you're willing to do to make that future happen. Are we going to have uh, glass oversight with virtual reality uh, with extended life and the end of disease? Or are we going to destroy our entire environment, all the plants and the animals, and we're going to have waste and destruction and government overreach? Which one do you want? Because the future is truly up to you as your students. Guys, this is the future of technology. Technology in five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, to talk about the singularity, the rise of Homo cyberneticus, of uh, the artificial prime. We've talked about really cool stuff. So go online, get into your homework. You will have some homework following up this video. If you need anything from me, please let me know. I am here for you, I am your professor, and I hope this spurs interest. Go online, read Ray Kurzweil, go online, look up the singularity, look at technology in the future and some of the ideas and the pieces of tech we talked about. It's really cool stuff, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Get involved at the political side, get involved on the legislation side, get involved in programming and writing the technology and creating the rules. Get involved and develop the future you want. That's why you're in this class. That's what you need as a person to do going forward. Future relies on you. 
I am relying on you to make sure that my future is one of Star Trek and utopia and happiness. I hope you have a very fruitful day. Bye, guys.